Millions of those with the financial capacity moved to dramatically expanding suburbs. By the end of the 1950s, nearly half of the U.S. population, most of whom were white, lived in new suburbs, while people of color increasingly populated inner cities. America reached its peak as an urban nation in the early 1950s. In the early post-war period, American cities remained dynamic places full of busy sidewalks, cafes, office buildings, and bustling neighborhoods connected to downtowns. Urban railways ran full schedules, with cars often packed to capacity. By 1960, these urban railways had disappeared from all but the largest American cities. Former rail and mass transit patrons embraced the automobile to ferry them to and from increasingly distant suburban homes. Eisenhower's 1956 Interstate and Defense Highways Act, the largest public works program in American history, facilitated the growth of suburbs and the complex of industries that sustain them. After 1956, wide concrete highways funneling people to and from suburbia bisected once vital neighborhoods and soared over other areas of town. Increasingly, as professionals and businesses left for the suburbs, decline of downtowns was evident in abandoned buildings, deteriorating neighborhoods, and increased crime. Those left behind were often minorities and working class whites with limited access to the jobs that fueled the affluent society. Blacks, Jews, and others were often explicitly denied the suburban dream by discriminatory loaning practices, redlining, and racist housing covenants in the new neighborhoods. The U.S. Supreme Court outlawed racial covenants in Shelley v. Kramer in 1948, but they persisted in practice throughout the 1950s. Suburbs across the country used neighborhood and homeowner associations to restrict access on the basis of race, ethnicity, and religion. In the South, racial segregation, which was supported by law, remained entrenched. In the North, racism could be overt, with posted signs informing blacks, Jews, or others they were unwelcome. Racism ensured that most suburbs outside the legally segregated South were completely white and not representative of the period's increasing racial diversity. Suburbs grew because of demand and new technologies. The assembly line track home was the most significant innovation. Block after block of mass-produced homes, known as housing tracks, transformed enormous regions of rural landscape into seas of houses linked by highways to islands of new shopping and strip malls. Suburban housing pioneers, including William Levitt, builder of the prototypical modern track suburb of Levittown on Long Island, New York, were hailed as heroes in the years after the war when serious housing shortages left some returning war vets living with parents or even in converted chicken coops. Using large tracts of farmland on the outskirts of big cities, Levitt built simple four-room homes complete with the latest kitchen appliances. Snapping up the houses as fast as Levitt could build them, enthusiastic buyers drew other developers, like California's Henry J. Kaiser, into the business. The federal government encouraged this trend with Federal Housing Administration and Veterans Administration loans, featuring modest down payments and reasonable interest rates. Suburbs had long been part of American life. By 1955, however, suburban planned communities accounted for 75% of all new housing starts. Suburban development was so dramatic during the 1950s that it prompted critics like historian Godfrey Hodgson to write about a, quote, suburban industrial complex, comparable in scope to the military-industrial complex of the Cold War. Americans in the 1950s embraced consumption as a cornerstone of quality of life and an important weapon in the battle for hearts and minds during the Cold War. After nearly two decades of material sacrifice during depression and war, Americans emerged with an appetite for consumption not seen since the 1920s. As in the 1920s, sophisticated advertisements from savvy marketers peddled a wide variety of new technological wonders. During the 1950s, more money was spent on advertising than on public education. Newly available credit cards, including the popular Diners Club, American Express, and Sears, made it easier for Americans to purchase and enjoy advertised products. 
By the end of the decade, there were more than 10 million Sears cards in American wallets, and millions of consumers began to rely on short-term credit to outfit their new homes. Actively promoted by the U.S. government as a critical attribute of good citizenship, mass consumption represented more than just an economic trend. For the first time in American history, political leaders, economists, and foreign policy experts recognized that consumption, not production, was the single most important contributor to America's economic health. Popular publications such as Life presented economic data suggesting the success of the post-war economy hinged on consumer purchase of new homes, appliances, and cars. Mass consumption was extolled as a virtue that would lift all Americans and provide universal employment and prosperity. The Cold War figured prominently in both private and governmental encouragement of consumption. Richard Nixon and Nikita Khrushchev's 1959 kitchen debate reinforced a familiar association of consumption with patriotism. Mass consumption also represented American culture worldwide as American products traveled the globe. During World War II, American products from cigarettes to sodas reached the far corners of the world. By 1950, the Coca-Cola company had 60 bottling plants on six continents. Newly opened post-war trade routes even funneled American products behind the Iron Curtain. During Nixon's visit to the American National Exhibition in Moscow, he and Khrushchev paused at a Pepsi stand to debate geopolitics. Like the Japanese and Nazis during World War II, the Soviet government dismissed American products like soda as frivolous, but the two million Muscovites who attended the 1959 National Exhibition were as taken with dishwashers and sodas as were Americans. People throughout the world came to know America through its material culture, exported by the millions of tons. Some embraced these material ambassadors and the culture they represented. Others viewed the tidal wave of American products in a global market with intensified anti-American animosity and felt these spearheads of American capitalism threatened the nature of their societies. The global spread of U.S. culture during the late post-war period through Hollywood, TV, music, and consumer products was so successful that American cultural imperialism caused tensions even between Cold War allies. The governments of France and Italy both worked to block importations of coke during the 50s. But in the U.S., the global spread of consumer culture was celebrated. Life magazine publisher Henry Luce proclaimed the post-war period as the American century. Luce and others articulated a market version of containment, one where American culture peacefully won the hearts and minds of people across the globe. Powerful U.S.-based multinational corporations that grew to unprecedented size and influence during the 1950s aided the global marketing of American culture.